Okay, so we're gonna do our lecture on the diencephala and then some fun review of labeling because don't forget you have a labeling quiz on Thursday. And then we have our follow-up worksheet like the other ones we've done this whole chapter, short, sweet. Um, and then for our, our flex time today, and Wednesday, we have a model to make. So we've made a model of a bone and we've made a model of a sliding filament theory. So today we're gonna make a model of, of a brain and I'll tell you more about that. And I'm just gonna play some music later while you work on your colorings. So does anybody have questions on the itinerary? Quiz this Friday, labeling, I mean Thursday. Test next Thursday which will really seem more like a quiz because there's not a lot of content, but we have to do the physiology or functioning piece of this, and then we'll be done. If you were looking at the syllabus, we were gonna do anatomy of the eye next week, um, but I'm gonna shift that to um, finish off the brain before break, and then we can start with the eyes when we come back. The eyes are awesome. Okay, so into the inner brain, here we go. So we should be able to identify the functions of the three major structures of the diencephalon, the hypothalamus, thalamus, and epithalamus. In addition, we should be able to describe functions of two structures that play a role in regulation, pineal body and the pituitary gland. So we'll find those as we get going. So the green piece here, this is the inner brain. So we've already talked about the cerebrum out here. We labeled all the lobes. We talked about the corpus callosum. That's this big arch. Remember, that's the one that allows right and left to communicate. We talked about the cerebellum for balance and the brain stem, midbrain pons, and medulla. So today we're going to talk about this portion here, the green piece. Green piece, that's an organization. Um, that is called the diencephalon. So it sits on top of the brainstem. It's totally enclosed within the two hemispheres. So the two sides inside of it. And the three major pieces are the thalamus. So use this as a point of reference. Look for this central, like the circular piece in the middle here. And then hypothalamus, remember hypo means below and epi means above. So you see this smaller arch not the big corpus callosum, not this very obvious fornix, but this less obvious arch that sits right on top of the thalamus, and that's the epithalamus. Remember, epi is above or upon. When doing the labeling quiz, these structures are the ones most commonly missed. So you really want to have a good handle on where those pieces are. So I like this picture because um, of the different colors, identify all the pieces we, on, we want to talk about today. Again, the circular piece in the middle, thalamus, that's our point of reference. Above it, epithalamus, which contains the choroid plexus. You'll see choroid plexus written here. Hypothalamus, the purple. Um, this is like this stalk that sits down below it. We're gonna talk about the pituitary gland right here and the pineal body right here, this light purple piece. Okay, so those are the structures we're looking at today. <clears throat> so the thalamus, remember that's your point of reference. Find that first, then label above, epi, and below, hypo. So what does it do? It's basically like a switchboard. So information is coming in um, through your brainstem, right? And then it's sent to the cortex according to what part of the cortex needs to um, deal with it. So it will kind of tag sensations as being positive or negative as they come through and then move them to that location of the cortex. Remember this right here, our central sulcus. Remember behind it, this ridge is the postcentral gyrus, which is also called the um, sensory cortex. So we're gonna send signals up through the thalamus to the sensory cortex. And then the actual interpretation of that sensation happens at the cortical layer. So this also regulates our consciousness, our sleep cycle, our alertness. So um, remember when we, you had the mouse question and you were trying to identify 
daylight and darkness because that's when he was going to be active on our test. Um, so the um, thalamus is going to help identify that um, awakeness cycle. So epithalamus means above, right? Above the thalamus right here. Kind of hard. We just drew it in there. Um, this main function is that it contains the choroid plexus, which is a group of capillaries. Capillaries, smallest blood vessels. And it creates the cerebral spinal fluid. So remember the cerebral spinal fluid acts as a shock absorber. It's gonna fill all the ventricles, all the empty spaces of the brain, as well as surrounding it. Um, and it also contains antibodies to protect against disease. So that's the epithalamus. So that's kind of important. Below the thalamus, we have the hypothalamus, hypo below right here. This is going to regulate body temperature, keeping your temperature at 98.6 or raising it for fever to get rid of foreign um, organisms, water balance and metabolism. So that's all gonna be part of the hypothalamus's job. It's also part of the limbic system. And if you've had psychology class, you probably talked about the limbic system um, quite a bit when talking about the brain itself, because it is related to memory and emotions. And it's not just one piece of the brain because one piece of your brain can't handle something as complex as emotions, right? Our emotions come from situations we've been in. So past memories. Um, identifying them as positive or negative. So there's lots of things that go together when looking at behavior, learning, and, and um, emotions or um, personalities. So the limbic system plays a big role of that, and the hypothalamus plays um, as a component of that limbic system. So our hypothalamus is regulating um, appetite, pain, thirst, pleasure controls. And we'll talk more about the pleasure controls with the um, hippocampus. It also regulates this pituitary gland right here, this little bulbish dangling structure at the end of a stalk. Um, the pituitary gland we talked about in ninth grade when we talked about sex ed. So it was responsible for releasing gonadotropin releasing hormones, um, follicle stimulating hormones, luteinizing hormones, if you remember all of those. Also, this is growth hormone. So these are all regulated by the pituitary gland, as well as a number of other hormones are released from the pituitary gland. It's really like your master endocrine gland. So that is directed according to the hypothalamus. So that's pretty important. Um, so this regulates things re related to development, changing body features, right? Growth, puberty, maturation, reproductive processes, producing milk, um, the whole pregnancy process. Okay, also responsible for converting food into energy. Sitting behind the thalamus is the pineal gland. So remember the light purple in the front um, that we saw, the pineal gland. So this secretes melatonin. So you might be familiar with melatonin. Um, Maybe you take melatonin gummies to go to sleep. I do. It regulates your sleep cycle, so it helps you sleep. If um, these bright lights, these these blue lights or whatever kind of lights come off of our computers, um, they kind of upset the release of melatonin. So if you want to sleep well, don't look at a computer screen, a phone screen, or a TV screen 20 minutes before you go to bed. And so that will allow um, your pineal body to start secreting the melatonin that's going to help you go to sleep. Serotonin is another, um, these are neurotransmitters, not hormones. This is another neurotransmitter released from the pineal gland. So it's kind of like a mood stabilizer, um, keeps you steady or happy. Um, so this whole red section <clears throat> is the limbic system. So the limbic system isn't a specific structure in the brain. It connects the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the hippocampus, and um, the amygdala. So a bunch of other structures are connected to it. It's quite interesting when talking about the brain, however, 
um, because it has to do with our behaviors. People with impairments in the limbic system typically have emotional um, characteristics that make them slightly unsteady, um, outbursts of anger, and this can be genetically programmed. Or it could be due to damages in brain tissue. And we're gonna see that in this little story here. So has anybody heard of Phineas Gage? Shout out if you did. You might like the long story. If we were in class, we would play this out. So it's more than 10 minutes, so I don't wanna play it in, um, in a Zoom. <clears throat> but this is like a reenactment of this very famous story of Phineas Gage. So um, I'm going to give you the shorter version here, and it may be enough to intrigue you to watch the longer one. Let's see. In 1848, Phineas Gage is working on a railroad in Cavendish. He's packing the powder down with the tamping iron, blowing up rocks. The charge detonates prematurely, and this tamping iron, this three foot, seven inch, 13 and a half pound tamping iron, fires into Phineas Gage's head. It enters into his left cheek, it passes behind his left eye, it severs his optic nerve, and then comes out his forehead and lands 30 yards away. Phineas Gage was able to survive having a three foot seven inch bar shot transcranially through his head. In 1850, Henry Jacob Bigelow, who's the professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School at the time, brought Gage and John Harlow, his doctor, to Harvard for an examination. Bigelow essentially concludes that this man did have a giant iron bar shot through his head and did survive, and he publishes the case in 1850. After the accident, Phineas Gage goes from business-like and efficient to no longer able to follow through with his plans. He becomes the textbook case for post-traumatic personality change. And that's why you find him in a lot of the modern medical, neuroscience, psychology literature. Phineas Gage has been at Harvard Medical School for 160 years. So in many ways, I see him similarly to how you would see one of the famous professors who hang on the wall. He's an important part of Harvard Medical School's identity. And by continually reflecting on his case, it allows us to continually change how we want to understand the human brain and how we interact with our historical understanding of neuroscience. Is that this um, tamping iron severed his limbic system. And this is responsible for emotions and behaviors. So where he was like, he was a foreman of a crew, right? So he was obviously a responsible individual who worked well with others, a very stable, steady man. And after the tamping iron, he had a complete change in behaviors. He was sporadic, erratic, um, aggressive. And like, like they said, he could not follow through on any, um, any tasks. So that is probably where we first started learning about um, the connections that created our behaviors. So that's the point to that story there. So this tamping iron would have went through um, this region here, going through part of the temporal lobe and the hippocampus. The hippocampus, um, most mammals like humans have two, one on both sides, and it's embedded deep within the temporal lobe. So it's, it's not actually part of the diencephalon, which is today's topic, but it's still part of that inner brain. So this is important for converting short-term memory to long-term memory. So Ms. Nook tells you once that hip hippocampus is responsible for memory, you remembering that 20 years from now would be long-term, right? So we have to change those short-term memories to long-term memories. Also involved in spatial memory. So recognizing like where you are and what direction would be north and south, if you're gonna turn right or left, that sort of thing for navigation. And it's the first region, or at least one of the first regions of the brain to be damaged during Alzheimer's. So these are the sorts of things that are lost with Alzheimer's, right? A sense of spatial awareness, um, a sense of or their short-term or long-term memories. So that's one part um, of, the, of the limbic system in addition to the thalamus and hypothalamus. The other piece here is the amygdala, 
<clears throat> so the amygdala is super important um, in learning because this is more responsible for you, like your fear and anxiety. And you know, it's hard to learn when you have fear and anxiety, right? So we want to meet all of your, um, all of your basic needs, right? If your basic needs aren't met, then you won't be able to learn. And that's like not even talking about content wise. Um, so they're two almond shaped, these two right here, nuclei pieces, gray matter, meaning their cell bodies. Remember the outer cortex is gray and the inner cortex is white because the inner cortex is more axonal. And that's that, um, the myelin sheath. So the amygdala plays a big role in memory and decision-making and then emotional responses, but more of the negatives. So things related to fear and anxiety. If you had damage in the amygdala, you would be calm and cool and really mellow and not really care about things. So um, Phineas Gage obviously did not disrupt his amygdala because he kind of went the other way. So his hippocampus was more likely affected, okay? So, coming to an end here, these are all of the words for the parts of the brain um, that we are covering on this section of the test. This first piece, these are um, our, our protective layers. This here, this is our cerebral cortex. All of this group will be on your quiz. The yellow, um, most of this is that inner brain minus these three words. That's going to be on your quiz. And corpus callosum, brain summits, these are like words associated with the cerebrum. <clears throat> the brain sim is connected to the cerebrum. The cerebellum actually should go over here. That's connected to the cerebrum. Corpus callosum connects the two cerebral hemispheres. So um, you can use this. We wanna practice labeling before Thursday, right? But you also want to, um, for the next week's quiz, next Thursday, we'll do the functions. So this would be a great page to use to make flashcards. So write the word on one side and the function on the other side or Quizlet, that works too. Today, we're gonna do our first practice of um, labeling in a more um, laid back way. And we're gonna go into Wiser Me and there's two coloring sheets for you. So we're gonna spend five minutes coloring. And, um, and then we will go over those answers and then I'll tell you what's, and I'll explain the next thing to you. So I'm getting up my clock and I'm setting five minutes. In Google Classroom, if you go to third hour, my MSU people actually posted this last week. So a couple of you may have already done it. Um, parts of the brain practice, third hour. So a few of us have already done it. <clears throat> I thought I was gonna launch the page, but I didn't. <laughs> so it'll look like this. And then you have um, different pencils, brushes you can use and grab colors. Here it tells you what color to color each item. And down here, we're gonna do the inner brain. The first picture is the outer brain. Okay, do you have any questions right now? So I'm gonna give you five minutes to do that. While you're doing that, I'll put a fun little song on about Phineas Gage. Okay, so the frontal lobe, I would, so most everybody is gonna be similar to this one. Okay, so the red frontal lobe in front, so your dividing line, look for your central sulcus. Okay, dividing line, central sulcus. The yellow parietal line will be behind the central sulcus. Red frontal in front of, green occipital in the very back, and orange is thalamus. I would probably use this dividing line right here. It's, it reminds me of like earmuffs. That's my thalamus and they it points towards the front. So I would divide there. Cerebellum brainstem. And then down here we have the corpus callosum, the big arch. Light blue, the piece with the circle, uh, thalamus. 
dark blue, the piece that sticks down in front of that hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland, purple dangling here. Um, the red, we have midbrain. So this portion of our spinal cord, pons, the big circle, the medulla is the bump, medulla oblongata. Okay, so you can double check your work on that. Um, I can release them all if you need to make some corrections. But hopefully that was a little bit of um, non-stressful labeling practice, a little bit of coloring. So the next thing, so we have follow-up worksheet, like we've been doing, um, our follow-up worksheet should go pretty close to our brain um, lecture. It will include cerebellum and brainstem because there weren't questions on the last lecture. So you're gonna finish up the Monday Zoom right here is, you'll recognize the format, covering diencephalon, cerebellum, brainstem. That won't take you 10 minutes. You'll get that turned in today, and then you're going to move on to our project. So the project is a um, making a model, and you have today, tomorrow, and Wednesday to do it. Um, there are directions embedded within a PowerPoint. So um, going to this one, the brain model. This PowerPoint is both instructional and educational, so it'll have like it introduces pieces and parts, but it'll go through their functions. So good review before telling you how to make the, um, how to demonstrate this in a model. So then it says brainstem model, what you should do in order to make it. Um, the, the directions for this one is for a clay model. So see, it'll tell you a couple of things about the cerebellum and then it tells you what, how you can make that, that using clay you have if you don't have clay at home right now you know you do have today tomorrow and the next day so you could go out and get some clay um if you don't want to you might choose to use some other things you might even make um you can make play-doh with flour and and look up online they got di di um, directions for that but you could use any materials you wanted that you had at home maybe you had um a styrofoam ball and you wanted to use that so if you don't have clay, I don't, I don't mind. I'm open to other structures being in your model, okay? This is just giving you ideas on how to create that if you are using clay. Um, in the end, you will upload a video in Flipgrid of your model. And I want you not to just tell me what the pieces and parts are, which some of us did on our last modeling, but I want you to tell me what they do. So point it out and say, this is the cerebellum. It's responsible for coordination and balance, like that, okay? So that um, is what we're gonna do for the next few days for our, um, we won't have any additional items on Wednesday. That, that will be it for our flex. And then Thursday, we'll come back and we'll um, have our brain quiz, and we're going to do a virtual dissection of a brain. So with that, what questions do you have, my friends? <laughs>